It's John Bowden from Rock History Book, and we've got another interview, this time around uh, from someone that, well, the type of artist we don't usually interview. We should more often. I spent a lot of years programming jazz and new age, contemporary jazz, smooth jazz, where I kind of left pop and rock altogether. This was in the late 80s, early 90s. Specifically in the late 80s, someone came to the radio station and played me Siberian Express. The Dave Becker Tribune. It featured Dave's brother, who's a very popular drummer named Bruce. But immediately I started playing this album, which off and on has been hard to get through the years. We talk about that. Ken Calais, a longtime music legend and the engineer who did Fleetwood Max Rumors, has been a longtime friend of David Becker and has produced some of his stuff. But it's been a long career. We talk about the ECM label, Narada, the New Age label, Wind of Hill, him getting signed, his brother, his latest projects, and a lot more, a sensational guitarist, David Becker, on Rock History Book. How was your trip? I was great, man. I'm, I'm still a little jet lag, but it was wonderful. It was good. Uh, we did, I did 12, 12 concerts in the three weeks. So it was pretty, pretty grueling, but it was great. And I'm planning to go back uh early next year do some more stuff it's interesting overseas i always find that you know when i was in uh i I was in jazz then i was in smooth jazz but before that i was in new age music which got me into jazz and smooth jazz and uh, you know i used to run smoothjaznow.com i was co-chair of the canadian smooth jazz awards uh uh but uh you know a lot of the guys a lot of the the cat like more than george benson a lot of the other guys would say hey man you know what there's just an interest out there there's just a more of an in, intense curiosity i don't know what it is well you know i've never compartmentalized or or put my stuff into a specific genre or you know style because you know jazz is a broad word and since the very beginning, we've always appealed to non-jazz people for whatever reason. I don't know what that is, but I think it has to do with the fact that I've always believed and learned from people that when you play music, you play not to the people that you think like it. You play to you, the fan. So I was just reacting to me as a fan. And, you know, my musical background is so diverse. When I was a kid, my oldest brother, Ed, he's six years older. He had every record imaginable when it came out. He had the first Led Zeppelin record. He had Jimi Hendrix, you know, Jethro Tull and all this stuff. And plus we had Beatles records and Monkey records and 45s and all this stuff. So we never thought about this is this, this is that. My parents had this huge collection of classical music. So we just kind of accepted music as music. And I never thought about, you know, specifically this is this and this is that. And when I started playing trumpet when I was 12, because I first started on drums, uh, you know, I got exposed to big band music and concert band music. So Chicago was huge at the time. And all those elements, I think, are what made up what I, I look at as my music. And I always wanted to just go out and play. Obviously, there was a point when I became a jazz snob, you know, because I had to sort of get into that zone, which we all do. But once I did that, I just before I hit the road the very first time in 1984, I remember going through like all the old rock records like Bad Company and and Led Zeppelin and revisiting them with a new perspective. And I'm like, wow, I didn't realize how much this stuff had an impact on me. So that opened my head to the fact that, you know, um, those things were just as important as the Charlie Parker and West Montgomery records I listened to. Uh, I find that, you know, for me, going through different periods of my life, uh, going through these little, it's like going through tunnels where I'll start and I'll listen to something. McCartney does this in a very cliched way. He says, you'll hear the Beatles in the back say, oh, they were a good little band. You know, he'll say that, you know, through osmosis or something, you'll hear them. But I find that going through tunnels at different periods of my life that I'm able to listen to, as you kind of referenced, the older records in a whole, I mean, I don't know if the ears change, if, but I think our perspective of everything changes because everything's, you know, sure. you go back and you go, oh, I, I don't know why I'm here. It's, I feel like I'm hearing this for the first time, or maybe it's an appreciation thing, maybe all of the above. I think it's a, it's, it's a combination of all that. Um, I can refer to the very first record that I remember as a kid listening to intensely was. A classical album, uh, Edvard Grieg, the Norwegian composer, his concerto in A minor. 
And my parents had that. I used to stand in front of the, you know, the big stereo with a tinker toy and conduct, you know, as four. But I can a- actually look at parts of that music and I can think about how I internalized minor and major passages and just stuff like that, that now that I know as a musician what it means. But then I was just a kid seeing these kind of visualizations of things and equating them to paintings on the wall. But when I go back and listen to it now, I still have that feeling I had when I was four, but I know more. So I can sort of look at things a little more analytically, but also I can go back to that thing. And I think that's, you have to maintain both, you know, because we are who we are. I mean, if I look at myself at age 10 and now, you know, I'm still that guy, but I've grown and and added to the whole piece. So that's, I think, a big part of it. Yeah. One of the things you're really good at, I was listening to Planets a lot last night and this morning, and there's this thing that you, you are just so good at creating moods. There's that thing that we all grew up with when sometimes maybe a Billy Joel or a Bernie Top and Elton John thing, they'd write something or they'd have a mood in a, in a song and you'd go, yeah, I, I get that mood. I understand that. Planets to me was just like, it's like, you know me. Like, what was the impetus for that album? I'm curious. You create so many beautiful moods on that album. Thank you. First of all, thank you. That's a great compliment. I appreciate that. Um, you know, the thing is, Planets is a thing that came about from uh, the fact that I did the TV show for the Space Channel. Yeah. And I had been doing a lot of solo concerts. So uh, um, I I needed a new record for a tour last year in New Zealand. And my record label is in Germany, uh, in Osnabrück, Acoustic Music Records. So to get physical CDs to take to sell at the gigs, I'd have to order them and they'd have to send them over to the States. And I usually do that when I do European tours. I had a few left over, but I thought it's time for me to do a new record. So I just sat down with a lot of the things that I'd been playing live and also some of the things that I did on the the Planet session for the, the TV show, because that was all improvised, and sort of put that together you know, one of the things that um, I've learned over the years is pacing and how to assemble a, a set of music. And uh, it's interesting because one of my students in Germany that was at a, a workshop that I just did, he said kind of a similar thing. He said, you know, he said it's a great record because it it's so different each piece, but it works together. And I said, thank you. Uh, but that's so that's the idea, you know. For me, music is very visual. When I talked about that thing with Edvard Grieg, my parents had a painting of the Zugspitze, which is the highest mountain in Germany. And on that painting, there's a white cap of the Zugspitze. And on the side is a very kind of angular, sort of dark mountain that's next to it, you know? And every time the passages would come that were major, which I know now, that's the big white mountain. And when they were the minor passages, I was seeing that dark sort of thing. And I think that's, really what I do as a musician is I I visualize these things and I I don't know where it comes from, but obviously that's, that's a big part of why I guess I'm able to to communicate that because people always say, man, your music is very visual. But there's something I discovered a few years ago when I started writing reviews again. And, and uh, tell me if, when I started writing reviews after I was finished writing the review of something, I would understand that I mm-hmm. my mind was actually in a place. My mind was in a place that I knew structurally or a picture, but but for me, it was always a place. And I didn't know my brain ever did that. When did you first realize that you did that consciously? Because you probably did it before you realized it. I, I'm sure I did. I don't, I don't really know. I think I just became aware of it um, as I grew as a musician, you know, because for me, music is always about color. So, you know, it's funny because I did the album in 2004 with Joe DiOrio called The Color of Sound. And that's a play on Kandinsky's The Sound of Color. And, you know, when I look at the the covers of the records that we've done over the years, all the art directors, with the exception of maybe one or two, understood what we were trying to do. And were able to come with, with a visualization. And it's funny because when you make the music and it's in the studio and you listen back to it, you know, it, it, be, it takes shape. But as soon as that album cover comes in, that gives it even more light to me as the artist. And it's interesting because then I can associate a certain look to the music. I, I know it sounds kind of funny, but um, that's the way I perceive it. And it's still that way. When I still play, I still think of, of colors. You know, it's less about the notes and about the chords and the, the you know, that, that whole thing. 
I just listen to the sound of what's going on. And when I compose, it's the same thing. I'm just, I'm trying to find a way to tell a story within that piece of music. But also sonically, there's things that are going on because, you know, music is something you can't touch. You can't see it, but you can hear it. So, I mean, in, in, I mean, visually, obviously, we're talking about that thing about colors, but for most people, it's a feeling. So if you can emote something that gives a visual, I think that's that's really cool because all the great records, you talk about Steely Dan or Pink Floyd or whatever, those records when I was a kid, still now, I have visualizations of things that I, I saw when I heard that. Steely Dan's a good example because, you know, when I listen to Asia, there's certain things that I just see, you know, in that music. And it holds up, or Pink Floyd or Led Zeppelin. I, I still remember as a kid, because my brother Ed bought Led Zeppelin II the day it came out. You know, I was like eight or nine. And he put it on, you know, the record player. And I remember a whole lot of love, what was going on in my head and what, what I was seeing. And I remember the middle part. I could see John Bonham playing the congas or whatever the heck he's doing in that section and the way he was playing the cymbals. Because at that point, I was aspiring to play drums. So those were things that, uh, and I still remember how I felt now when I listen to that tune. So I think that's a, a big part of it. Oh, uh, is it Nobis? Nubis. I, Nubis. Yeah. That's just to, like, that's like, that really made me feel like, yeah, he knows me, man. Like I connect <laughs> with that energy of that song. Uh, it, it's very mindful to me. There's, there's just something about the, the, the essence of that song. Well, it's interesting that you say that because uh, that tune is named after one of our cats. And she is an um, interesting cat because until the pandemic, I didn't really know our cats. My wife, Lori, you know, she had them forever. And then we, when we got married and then we finally moved together and stuff, um, I did, you know, I would go on the road and I would see them and kind of deal with them a little bit. But when the pandemic hit and I was home all day for two years, you know, like all of us, I got to know these guys. They would stare at me and say, okay, now entertain me. And Nubis would go into my office and, and, you know, look at my guitar and sit on my pedals. But as soon as I started to play, she'd dash out. Very first time that she didn't is when I played the chords to Nubis. I had this thing. I, I'll grab my guitar. I'll show you. Yeah, so, please, please. Sitting, sitting, you know, kind of working on some stuff. And the very first thing I did is I played that chord. And the, and the melody just came out and she didn't leave so that I knew something was up with that so and it was the kind of tune where it wrote itself which a lot of them do because the way the chord structures I didn't have to do anything to play them and for a while I thought I needed a bridge but I didn't it's strange when you play it cuts out I, I noticed I've only noticed that once before when I interviewed Randy Bachman, he tr he started playing me like taking care of business or something. And every time he played guitar and I kept going, why is it? I, it must be, uh, I don't know why it just cuts out. Cut out now? Can't hear it. Yeah, it's weird. I think it has to do with some kind of like filter that uh, is on the audio. So it may just kind of like, like a compressor do that. Cause I've done stuff on uh, like, Concerts, you know, uh, online mm -hmm. concerts, you do them over Zoom and there's just something weird about the transmission of it. But in any case, when I wrote that, Nubis didn't run away. So I thought that was a fitting title for the tune. So. You talk about sequencing, though. It's interesting. You go from Nubis, then you go from Dawn over Dublin, which is, mm -hmm. you know, energy and just uh, you you have this great sequencing in this album. Like you you prefaced before, it's just it seems to really work. Well, thank you. Well, that that is always for me the most important part of it. Uh, you know, I learned that from a lot of people, and I have to credit obviously some of my influences. And uh, you know, you were talking, I think, in one of the interviews I just saw about Pat Metheny and Lionel Mays' record "As Falls Wichita," um, and I know the reason why it's called that. It's Steve Swallow came up with that title. Um, I actually, I, I know Steve, and I, I for some reason he had that title, or he came up with that phrase, and they used that. And the numbers that Lyle Mays is reading, those are cues, because what they did, they knew they were going to do this piece so long, and he was reading the cues of time. And Manfred Eicher was mixing because they mix everything like in a day or two, and I think it was either him or Jan Eriks Kunzhal who hit the button wrong button that brought up that you know that thing that Lyle was saying and they were like well that's cool let's leave it in so that's why it's there so oh it was John Helliwell I think it was John Helliwell who kept bringing yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, every interview I've done with him, he keeps bringing that up. You know, and he is just, he is the biggest surprise because you got this guy in his prog kind of what? prog classical pop band or whatever you want to call them. And then he's got this whole other side because horn players have a tendency that happens a lot where he has this crazy other inventive, beautiful side in classical music. So mm -hmm. how do you, how do you say this uh, is a Boca Chio? Boccaccio. 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 Yeah, that's an interesting one, too, because I had that. I, I wrote the initial part during the pandemic, just the, the first part, and it sat for a long time. And I kind of it's interesting because the melody that I heard, you know, that tune that, that John Lennon did, Oh, Yoko, you know, he's singing, Oh, yo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, so yes, yes, yes. Over and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's sort of like that. But I that that's I can't steal that. So. Um, I played around with the Ebo and stuff. And then when I was getting ready to record, I thought I need to come up with a melody. And that melody just came out of just the chords. And it just was something that uh, worked very well. And in Italy, I go there every year. I do this thing in Tuscany. It's in a, it's in a villa literally down the street from Sting's place. And I do a, a workshop with guitar players for a week. And then I do a concert outside on the overlooking the vineyards. And um in in Florence, I stay at this hotel, or my wife and I have been staying at this hotel called the Boccaccio. And I didn't know much about Boccaccio, but he was a, a guy who was active in the Middle Ages. He was a um, a writer, and he's very controversial because he wrote some pieces that were kind of the perspective of sex from a woman back then in that time. And you have to read his whole thing. But so I thought that was very fitting because it's kind of medieval sounding and whatever, and fits that sort of time period. So that's why. I called it Boccaccio. See that that's again. That was another song where I, when you know, like I, I just I love when I listen to something where it makes me just sort of stop what I'm doing. I know it's cliche to say that, but it's it's so I just stop. I didn't do any more research. I just listen to it, and you know, it's like breathing something in. And you don't have to listen to music that way, but I love listening to music that way. Oh, me too. I mean, that's that's what I do. I mean, I used to spend hours just listening to records i think that's one of the part about uh being a musician is it's not just you know practicing it's also learning to listen because ultimately when you play music that's what you're doing it's like having a conversation and you have to learn about you know what works and what doesn't and all these things but ultimately if you're tuned in you're going to know how to react and i think that's important and I, I it's funny because I got turned on to Eberhard Weber, who's one of my biggest influences, the German bassist that people. Don't oh, my know. God. He's the one that got me into ECM. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a guy who was uh, one of the teachers at GIT when I was a, a kid there. I was like 18. And he put on the following morning. And he said, in order to listen to this, we have to turn the lights out and I have to lay on the floor. <laughs> and I was like, mm -hmm. OK. And he laid on the floor and he put that record on and I went, wow. I mean, my life changed. And I met Eberhard. I met him a couple of times. Actually, I drove his bass from a gig at McCabe's in Santa Monica to the hotel when he was playing with Jan Garbarek. And we met and I, you know, I speak a little German and I lived over in Germany. And so we were talking about different things. And I had always hoped to work with him. But unfortunately, he had a stroke and he can't play anymore. But man, talk about somebody who knows how to sequence. Talk about somebody who knows how to create visuals. Eberhard Weber's the guy. And see, he's a huge influence on Lyle Mays. Whenever I would see Lyle Mays uh, and talk to him, we would talk about Eberhard. And I, I saw him, the last time I saw Lyle, um, I, or one of the last times I saw him, I said, hey man, did you did you get the new Eberhard record? He goes, man, do I know new, whatever it's called. Um, it's, uh, oh man, what's the title? No, the blanking on it, I should know. Endless Days. Man, do I know Endless Days? I listen to it every day. I love it. He goes, and he was crazy about it, Eberhard. And that's the thing. Matheny and uh, both he and Lyle Mace, they learned a lot from Eberhard. They, they were really influenced. That first Pat Matheny group record, to me, is very much influenced by The Following Morning, if you listen to that. And it came out, you know, just before they did that. And if, if you ask Pat, he'll tell you he's a huge Eberhard fan. So, um, you know, that through that, I, I understood the visualization thing and, and listening to music. So I used to lay on the floor and listen to Eberhard records or listen to John Coltrane or whatever. But it, it it was an interesting process because you do kind of fade off into some place. It's like meditation. 
but yet you have something to focus on. And that's what I like about Eberhardt's music is that there's always attention to detail. There's always something going on. Maybe not the melody, maybe not the, the chords, something counter, but it keeps you busy. It keeps you, you know, listening to things differently. And that's what I like to have in my music, if I can, is, is to have things that ju juxtapose, you know. Um, that's just how I, I, I hear it, I guess. Eberhardt's out, what was it called? Fluid Russell? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I heard that someone was playing it in the library. You don't play music in a library. I was in an Edmonton library and in the music section and someone, it wasn't very loud. I'm going, why are they playing music in a lot? And it, and I came up to the person. I said, what is, I was 19, I think, or in early twenties. And uh, they told me what it was. I'm going, I want, I, oh, and then I discovered ECM and I, and I, I, I was gone. And that's why they picked me to do a new age a show because I was such a big part of, and then they wouldn't let me play ECM stuff because it was too out there. They went, I said, no, 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 there wouldn't be Wyndham Hill without, uh, they wouldn't, well, I'll, wouldn't tell have I'll tell you a very funny story, John, is uh, ECM. So when I was 18 and I just graduated GIT, my goal was to go over to Europe and find a label to record my music. So obviously ECM was one of the labels that I wanted to, you know, visit. So I put a tape together. I mailed it from my, I have my, some family in Germany from their house and I didn't hear anything. So I went down to Munich and I went into their offices and I met this guy, Hans Wendel, who was, he worked for Manfred. I still know Hans. I mean, he's a great guy, but he, obviously he couldn't sign me, but he was very encouraging. And so I would bring him tapes every six months and we would talk and he, you know, would encourage me. And he actually helped us get some gigs. The first tour we did. He said, you should call this guy. You should call this guy. So in any case, I, um, he, he asked me once, he said, so uh, are you, you know, are you having any luck with any other labels? And I said, well, I sent my stuff to Wyndham Hill. I said, ah, Wyndham Hill, ECM rejects. <laughs> and so, okay. So years later, after we left MCA, because MCA was a great place for three years and then they moved everything and shut everything down. So we were looking for a new label and I had a meeting with uh, this guy from Wyndham Hill Jazz. And they were taken over by AM. and uh, And yeah. at the time, Ken Kelly and I were working on a project for Narada Records, who you know, uh, this artist we were producing. In Milwaukee. Arrange. Yeah. So we're, we're doing this record. And I walked into Sam Sutherland's office and I brought in a copy of uh, Siberian Express, which he knew. And he said, oh, man, I know your stuff. He goes, what are you working on lately? And I said, oh, you know, we've been touring. And I said, I'm producing this guy. Uh, for Narada Records. He goes, Narada Records, Wyndham Hell Rejects. And so the point of that is, is that Hans told me a very, very poignant thing a long time ago that I still refer to. He said, there's no accounting for personal taste. It's all perspective. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. But then... You mentioned Ken Calais. Let's talk about Ken. Let's. You said Ken... when you started working with him, he was trying at that time to sort of move away from the Fleetwood Mac thing, the rumors yeah. thing. Yeah, because, um, you know, Ken did, the first thing Ken did was he remixed Rhiannon, and that's how he got the gig to do Rumors. And he said that he got called because he was working with Wally Hyder, and they called him in to do a remix. He did the remix, they all loved it, and they, they hired him to do Rumors, and he worked with Richard Dashett, who was a buddy of Lindsay's. And that, you know, they did a year long of that. And then they did Tusk. And then it did Mirage. And I guess after Mirage, Ken was just trying to get away from the Fleetwood insanity at the time. And when we met, I think I told you um, originally that, you know, Chet Himes was a very important guy. And it's funny because I just saw an interview with Chris Cross and he didn't mention Chet. And Chet should be mentioned because he was very instrumental in getting Christopher Cross signed because he was the engineer who did all the demos. And he knew Eric Johnson and he got all those guys together. He worked with Carol King. He did our first record. But in any case, I'll, it's another story. But Ken, so we had sort of left Chet's world and we were looking for somebody to work with. And, you know, I never thought about anybody from Fleetwood Mac. It was, you know, but I knew somebody who said, there's this guy, Ken Calais. He worked with Fleetwood Mac. And he's looking to get away from that stuff. And, he, and I think he just mixed a Chicago record or maybe tracked one of their records in the 80s. And so we called him up. And uh, he came over to the house and uh, he had heard Long Peter Matson, and he heard some of the demos for Siberian Express. And he goes, man, it's great. I love it. So 
um, I'd like to do a little bit more, you know, production stuff. And I had just gotten into guitar synthesizers. Um, it's kind of a long story, but through actually uh, Roger Nichols, who had a guy that made this thing called Walter Mitty, which you could plug a guitar into it without a pickup, just a regular guitar pickup, and it would generate the sound, but it didn't, it wasn't multi-tracking. It was just, you know, single notes. But in any case, through that, they developed this thing that I use called the Sentient Six. And uh, Ken said, come to my house. So my brother and I would drive to Malibu every day for like two and a half, three weeks. And at that time, Colby, his daughter, who everybody knows now, was four. And she was a terror. She would run around and scream and yell, and, you know, and stuff. Maybe she was even three. I don't know. But uh, we worked together a lot and we we got along great. We had a, a great rapport. And he would tell us Fleetwood stories. Go, oh, man, Mick calls me up all the time at three in the morning. And Ken, I got, you know, you got to work with us again. And Ken's like, no, Nick, I don't want to do that anymore. So I guess at that point, he was just trying to kind of get away from that. And I think to a larger degree, he, he came back around and did things with them in the 90s when he was when he had his company that did the surround sound stuff. And so revisited it and then didn't. But for whatever reason, that was that was his thing. You know, we got along great and we still do. I mean, I don't see him that often, but I just saw him not too long ago. We did a a, a Dolby mix, an uh, Atmos Dolby mix for Planets, just the song, which I'll send it. I'll send it to you. to, to mm -hmm. hear. And because uh, that's what he's doing now. But yeah, he had great stories about that. And he would talk about how he recorded Lindsay's guitars and how he would sometimes, you know, put a solo down and keep it, even though Lindsay would say erase it. Because one thing Ken Kelly learned from Bones Howe, the great producer, is that Bones would do it uh, like a take. That was Ken's first gig, I think, working with uh, the Fifth Dimension as an engineer or one of those bands. And Bones would say erase it. And Ken would say, man, that's a great take. And he said, no, no, we'll get a better one. So Ken said, if ever I'm in charge, I'm going to keep everything. And that's what he would do. He would keep stuff. Lindsay would play solos and he would record everything. And then Lindsay would go off, he'd come back and Ken would kind of piece together a solo and Lindsay would listen to it and go like, oh yeah, yeah, sounds great. So, you know, he'd do stuff like that. And, he, you know, to a larger degree, I learned a lot from him in the studio. About, uh, I, uh, I got to ask you a Fleetwood Mac question. We'll get back to this in a second. Uh, oh, I asked, you know, Rick Emmett of Triumph. I asked Rick, I said, Rick, you know, that that big love thing, you know, that that he, Lindsay's always doing that, that little picking really fast picking and he's singing along with it. And I says, uh, I said, I got into an argument once with a guy at a party. And I, I said, I'm not a guitarist. I'm a drummer. Like my, 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 you know, like after a month, my son said, can I get a real teacher? Oh, that hurt. Anyway, um, I said, uh, the guy was saying, he says, that's actually not as hard as it looks. And I went, Really? And I've heard guitarist in my mind, to, just just wait, wait, wait. I've heard guitarist, uh, um, I think it was Larry Burnett of, of uh, Firefall once told me, he said, well, what I'm doing there is actually a lot easier than it looks. It just seems complicated. It's something, I think, the Cinderella intro for Firefall. Anyway, so I asked Rick Emmett, I said, is that hard? He says, he says, he says I'll go halfway on that. He says, it's not easy. You got to have your chops together to do that. What's your take on that as a guitarist? I'd say what Rick said, you know, there's a lot of ways to finger pick and, and um, many guys have different techniques. It's not hard once you know how to do something, but you have to be able to get the timing and the feel right. And Lindsay has a certain way of playing. Lindsay has a very unique way of playing, which I think is underrated as a soloist too, because he's got some great solos that I think he's played. He doesn't have, he doesn't play a lot of chops, you know, like fast stuff, but he, he can play and he knows how to, He's a guy that obviously has an interesting approach to the instrument because the electric stuff is so far away from the acoustic stuff, but it's not because of the way he plays. And I think once you start, when you see him, you you understand that. So um, anybody who does anything like that with finger stuff, it's, you know, it takes, it takes time to develop it. But what, like, I think I know what he meant about saying it's not that hard Sure, when I'm playing something and people go like, well, how do you do that? Well, after you know how to do it, it's not that hard, which you have to get to that place. You know? Well, Rick had mentioned too, he says, after that, he says, yeah, but he's also singing. He says, yeah. you know, that's that sure. I mean, that playing and singing is something I've never done because I don't sing, but I know people that do. And like James Taylor, you know, just look at James. James is the master of that, you know. But I think when guys do that, they develop the ability to be able to sing 
and play based on how they feel and how that's how their technique develops more so than just like they learn the technique and then they sing. I think in Lindsay's case, that's a big part of it. Um, same with James, you know, but uh, if you, if you are sting, you know, watch sting play and say, or Getty Lee, you know, Getty Lee plays these complicated bass parts, but you know, it's all rhythmic, but he's singing over the top of it. So I remember sting said once in an interview, he goes, my goal is to play in one time signature sing in another, and then dance in yet another. <laughs> I thought that was very cool. So, Siberian Express, is it still available? You know, it should be. It is. You can get used copies. Um, that's the only thing that I'm kind of annoyed at with Universal. And if anybody from Universal is listening, <laughs> you guys should just put it out digitally because everybody wants to get it. Yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, I don't have much control. I've tried to talk to Universal about it, and I'm still in the process of trying to get them to be aware of the fact that they should put it out. But yeah, it was a big record for us. I mean, it was number one um, on the NAC charts, and it, it when it came out, it, it it blew up. I mean, it was like we went from. I mean, Long Peter Matson got a lot of attention, but when Siberian Express came out, man, we were all over the radio. It was like. Uh, I, I was, and I never anticipated that. It wasn't my intention to make a record that would be radio friendly because I've never thought that way. It's just that um, we just happened to have music that at that time fit on what they call the, you know, the jazz stations and then the new age or whatever. You want to new call adult it. contemporary NAC. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. And, um, and, you know, we, we got on the Grammy ballots with that record and, so it was just a, it was an interesting time, but um, I get a lot of people that ask. It's funny too, I, a lot of guys I meet now tell me that Long Peter Matson is the very first jazz guitar record they bought as a teenager, which I'm floored by because I would think they'd get Wes Montgomery or Pat Martino or something, you know, but the fact that they bought that, no, no, that was my introduction to jazz. I bought your record. I'm like, wow, that, that's so, you know, whatever that's worth, it's. No kidding. I mean, I asked, I was telling a friend that I was going to talk to you today. He, he, of course, he said, Siberian Express, ask him, man. Ask him. You got to ask him, why is it not on Spotify? I said, well, I'm sure he'll have an answer. Yeah, that's the answer is Universal has not put them up. And and uh, I, I'm in the process of trying to get them out there. I, you know, I have my contract still and I have an attorney friend and she was going to go through it. But she said, if I go through it, it's going to cost you like, you know, several grand and it's not worth it. You should just go on your own and see if you can find a loophole or just talk to them and say, I mean, it doesn't cost them anything. It's funny because um, the catalog from the universal days, I've got probably almost 50 pieces of music with universal that they administer. And uh, of that, the, that's the two records, Long Peter Matson and Siberian Express. And that stuff still earns money. I mean, I still see things that come around. So I don't know who, you know who to address but i'll I'll figure it out you know i mean you people can go on youtube and they can hear the record it's yeah. up there now yeah because i was up there but uh, one more thing uh what was uh, colby like to play with i know you played on a few of her albums you know Come full I, circle there yeah it's funny because um hmm. you know, i i moved to europe and and i was based over there for a long time and then i connected i reconnected with ken in the late 90s early 2000s and at that point Colby hadn't started making music like she is now. She just started to play guitar a little bit and sing. And, and Ken was getting her to go into the studio to get over the mic shyness. So I saw her, you know, and I knew her as a kid and stuff. And, and, and then I came back from Europe and to visit Ken and Diane, his wife. And, and Colby had just done this thing on MySpace and it kind of blew up. So they were negotiating an album deal. And we were talking about that. So I remember talking to her. She she got the deal with uh, Universal, I guess. And I remember she was sitting on the stairs and she was getting ready to go on the road for the first time. And I just said, let me give you a couple pieces of, of, of advice, you know, as your dad's old friend and whatever your, you know, your surrogate uncle. Enjoy the process. You know, don't get too heady about it and just go out there and have fun. And she's done real well for herself. So when the second album came, Ken called me and said, you got to play on this. I'm like, okay, so... But Col Colby wasn't there. So we just kind of tracked the things. Everything was sort of done. And the third album, Ken called me up or he sent me an, an email. He goes, where are you? And I had just come back to the States. I was still living in Europe. And I said, I just came to LA. He goes, 
be at the studio tomorrow at three o'clock. Like, I think it was uh, down in Santa Monica. So I show up and I'm like, he's like, I want to play some stems. I'm like, okay. So he plays me this stuff. And it's Colby, you know, with her boyfriend at the time. And they've got some acoustic stuff. Do you hear anything? I'm like, sure. So I get out there and start playing a bunch of stuff. And we did that for a couple of days. I didn't know that it was going to be an album. And then all of a sudden it turned into the record, all of me, I guess it's called, or whatever, whatever the third record is. And he credited me for guitar colors not guitar but guitar colors so and it's funny because she got nominated for a grammy i think the second or first album or, or, or the second album which i got to be a part of because i was a featured soloist because the record company had me or whatever ken did that which i didn't know about till later but so i was appreciative of that but that was pretty much it you know um there wasn't any tracking with any live musicians like you know. I, considering you do a master class, you must be honest with them. Or how do you handle when someone plays you something? Well, this is what I do. First of all, I, I listen to what they play or they play for me. And, and I try to give them some constructive criticism, meaning that I'll say, you should maybe think about this, or maybe you should work on your time, or maybe you should, you know, if somebody has a finished product, I don't want to be too critical of it. And I'll tell you why, because I think I mentioned this to you when we talked last time, is that for me, success is not how many records you sell, not how big your name is, not how many concerts you do, but it's completion. It's actually doing the task. If I set out to write a tune, I write it. If I set out to record a record, I record it and I finish it. If I set out to do a tour, I book the tour, I go out and play it. And that's all you can rely on, is to complete the project. And I learned that sort of the hard way because... It took us a long, long time to get Long Peter Matson done. Um, but it was a great experience because I spent all that time at the old Warner Brothers studio and I got to meet, you know, guys like um, Randy Newman and uh, the guy that did all the, the rock records, Michael Wagner and, um, you know, whoever came into yeah. John Denver and stuff like that. But the, my point is, is that when, when someone has a project that's done, I say, what are you going to do with it? You know, what's your plan? What, what do you want to do? Then I give them advice about what they could do. It's not up to me to decide, because remember what I said before about no, there's no accounting for personal taste. Leave it to me to say to somebody that sucks, you're never going to sell it, and they sell it. You know, Because I know for myself, I ran around for years with little tapes trying to sell my music, and I never in my wildest dreams imagined being on a major label. I never wanted to be. I thought that would be like the curse of the death of a jazz guy. And there I go signing with uh, MCA Records. And, you know, I have to credit Irving Azoff to that because he hired Ricky Schultz, who ran the jazz division and signed me at an early age of 22 or 23 and gave me that opportunity. So, you know, reflecting on that, when someone gives me something, you know, I want to ask him, what do you want to do with it? But if someone comes to me and says, I wrote this song, give me some advice, I might go, well, you may want to think about, you know, making the bridge shorter, you might want to do this, or maybe you want to add an instrument here, or, you know, think a little bit about the timing. It doesn't feel right. You know, the drums are a little bit out or whatever, stuff like that. Um, nuts and bolts things that I think anybody can learn something from. But I'm not going to critique the overall, like, no one's going to like that, because that's nonsense. You know, I mean, I was playing music uh, and people would tell me, you can't do that. You can't get a record deal. And, you know, and all of a sudden I did. And everybody looked at me like, how did you do that? You know, like, well, I just, I wanted to do it. I wanted to finish yeah. the start it, you know? So that's for me, an important part. Now, if somebody comes to me with their guitar playing and starts playing something and it's out of time and it doesn't feel right, I'm certainly going to tell them, you know, you need to work on your time, but I'll do it delicately and say, you know, you should maybe think about it this way, or maybe you should try to do this or see if you can do this or do work on it. It's hard. We all have to work on stuff, you know, nothing just comes from nothing. So um, that's what I try to give them. And I always try to give them a positive thing because ultimately, I mean, I've been doing this thing now for the last four years or three years for the Grammys, the Grammy mentorship. So I'm a mentor and I, they assign me different people. Sometimes I get people that are, that want to be booking agents and they want to get my perspective as an artist, which is great because I can talk about all the things. Really? Yeah. Oh. And I like doing that. And I, the last uh, one I had was a, a young artist, singer, songwriter, and you know, I would give her tasks. I'd say, you know, 
go out and you know make a one sheet for your CD or go and do this. Do you know what a one sheet is or do you know you know what this is? Things like that. So uh, it's it's interesting how one of the things when you meet young musicians is they don't really know what they want to do. And I've had this conversation with Pat Athene. Um, you know, you got to know what you want to do or at least figure out. So the first thing I say is, do you know what you want to do? Visualize it. If you think you want to do this or you want to do this or you want to be a side guy or you want to be an artist, then visualize what it what you think it feels like. Sit down every day for five minutes and imagine that. See that visualization of you doing that. And keep working. Well, it becomes it. normal. If you visualize yeah. it, it becomes right. But the goal is the habit, right? Yeah, it gets further away from you as you get closer to it, which is good. It's supposed to do that. Uh, but that's what you have to start at. And that's that's what I've always done. So uh, I can tell you countless stories of things that I wanted to do in my career that I never thought would come to fruition because the thing got stopped. But then it, it happened. But it happened when I didn't expect it. You know, I mean, I never expected to work with Ron Carter. You know, I mean, that was and we became friends. I mean, he's a wonderful guy and we had a great experience together. So. You just never know. Uh, I've never heard it said that way uh, um, before. I've got like, get it done. I've never, I have asked this question so many times and I'm going, duh, of course, of course. That's what it is though. You know, I, I think when we talked the first time, I I, I told you what uh, this guy, David Cholmson told me about, you know, just how do you feel when you do something? You know, don't think about it, just, just do it. And that's hard for people to do because we always second guess. You know, it's like, uh, obviously when you record music or you do a performance, that's a moment in time. And it's like looking at a Polaroid or whatever from 1965 and you're like, well, do I look like that? But mm -hmm. what you have to do is you have to, you have to kind of become comfortable with it. You know, there were numerous times in Japan where I was toast because, you know, I did five one nighters in a row in uh, Osaka and Kyoto and had just flown in from Tokyo and I was burning the midnight oil because it was like, you, you know, you do the gig and then the next day you go to the next place, do the next gig. But you have to find that place where you can just draw from what you do and know how you can manage the situation. I think that's the thing about becoming experienced. You know that as a radio guy, you know exactly. If someone put you in a studio to march on and said, go ahead and program this, this show for three hours, you'd have no problem. You'd know how to maneuver and do all the stuff because you've done it. And even if you had the, the pressure of having to do it in a short amount of time, I think that's what we learn is we learn how to do the thing we do. And it's never perfect. There's no perfection. But that's an interesting thing too about art because everybody says, well, it's, you know, perfection, Steely Dan is perfect. It's not perfect. It's, it's the idea of the perfection of what they wanted to achieve. But if you look at it, scrutinize everything, it's not perfectly in time and it's not perfectly in tune, but it works for the music. It's like if you go to um, to Florence and see the David, right? It's supposed to be the perfect man. His hands are too big. And Michelangelo did that on purpose to accentuate the hand that you look at it. And you start to notice it. You go like, wow, he does have big hands. That's weird. It's not perfect. So the imperfections are the perfections. Neil Sean. Uh, so Neil's, um, Neil appreciated your stuff. Yeah, Neil, it's interesting. I haven't seen him in a long time, but uh, we met on um, a couple of NAMM shows and he used to come by and hear me play when I was playing for Martin Guitars. So he would come by the booth and he'd say, man, you sound great. Love to hear you play. It's like, great. So we just saw each other all the time. And one of his guys that worked for him, forgot his name. He came over. He goes, you know, Neil really loves your playing a lot. Just wanted to tell you that. I said, wow, I appreciate that. So probably, I think it was around 87. We had just done Siberian Express. It wasn't out yet, but I was working with this um, MIDI controlled guitar thing that they made in Australia. And uh, it was designed by a guy in Australia, but it was also the pickup was designed by Larry Fishman who I met years ago when he first made the first pickup for Martin Guitars. That's another story. But so I was at this uh, trade fair in, in Milan and I'm playing, you know, at the booth. And here comes Neil. And Neil's like, hey, man, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm just here playing. He's like, ah, we're doing this thing over at the hotel. You got to come over and play. I'm like, OK, so I went over and I guess Sentian, the company, decided to, you know, do a display there. So I, I go to this hotel and there's Neil. and He's got his guitars, his Sean guitars pick one up, start playing it. 
And he goes, go play with the guys, man. So I, these Italian musicians, we start playing a blues or something like that. And uh, it was great. It was a nice evening. And then he's like, yeah, we're all going to go to dinner. So we went to dinner with this distributor. And in the car, we were driving around the lawn. And it was funny because I'm in the back seat, Neil's in the front seat. And he's telling me stories about Santana. And he goes, you know, man, he goes, I've never played Italy with Santana or, or no, with Journey. Never played Italy. I, maybe they have since. And he goes, we came here once with Santana. And he said, we got to the hotel and they told us, don't leave your rooms. I'm like, okay, why is that? He goes, yeah, there was something going down, man. And he said, everybody had to lock their doors and they had to sneak them out and get them to the airport and fly them out. And there was something going down with the mafia, but I don't know what the deal was. He didn't elaborate. Maybe he didn't know. And so they had a gig book with Santana, but it got canceled and they had to split. So that's all I know. Wow. As we were driving around, though, he had a he had a live tape of Miles Davis with Mike Stern. He loved Mike Stern. He's like, oh, man, have you heard Mike Stern? I'm sure. I said, I know Mike. He's like, oh, man, this is great. So we're driving around Milan listening to Mike Stern and Miles Davis talking about Santana. So that was yeah. And then he gave me a guitar. He said, I want to give you a guitar, which I used as the the MIDI guitar it, on Siberian Express. That's the guitar I'm holding is the Sean guitar. And I used that for at least five years on the road. I used to have it on a stand and I plug it in to the MIDI thing. And then I used it on a couple of tracks. Uh, I think I used it on third time around on Rios, the first track. And I think on song for JB or one of those tunes I used to play it. So in the eighties, I hung out with the guy who was the biggest Neil Sean fan in the universe. Yeah, I go, yeah, they just got this new guitar, this new vocalist, Steve Perry. Says, yeah. Yeah. He's great. He's going to be the best thing ever, but come on. He's like, we'd be at parties, he'd bring me, you know, he just loved Neil. Neil's great. And it's funny because when we were in the car together in the line, you know, he said, I said, he goes, man, I can't do what you do. And I said, man, I was listening to you when I was 16. You know, I mean, yeah. you were a big influence, but he's very humble. And, you know, yeah, I think to a certain degree, Neil never got his due as a guitar player. I think people who know like you and me, they know, but, you know, Journey was always about the song, which is fine. And he's great at playing stuff for the song. Yes. That song in uh, Don't Stop Believing is amazing, you know, because um, he plays the melody to the chorus before it comes in. And his ability to do those little parts that he did and stuff like uh, uh, Wheel in the Sky and all that stuff. I mean, not, those are, to me, without Neil Sean, you know, Steve Perry's got a great voice, but he, his presence in Journey is certainly very important. And, uh, you know, as a, as a guitar player, as a guy who can solo, he's, you know, and I mean, he was playing with Santana when he was 15. So, I mean, it's got to rub off, you know. A Journey into the Unknown, were, were you improvising on that? Yeah, that's yeah, all. Cause, yeah, it sounded like that in a very beautiful way. Uh, Thank love you, it. I, I came up with that idea of that little um, kind of four bar or two bar thing. And uh, then I just decided to go in and just see what would happen. So I told the engineer, first I, I played that chord and I was just improvising. I told the engineer, just, just run the machine. And I played everything and then that thing kicked in and then I just played and I, it needed some drums. And you know, because my brother's a drummer and I'm a frustrated drummer, I decided to play it myself. So I went in and just overdubbed some cymbal and some snare which you can, it's not mixed really loudly, but it's there, you can hear it. By the way, speaking of your brother, you said, you you know, in the beginning with drums, is he your older or, or younger brother? And 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 obviously he's done incredibly well. Yeah. Um, but he's two years older than me. So he, you know, I have to credit him for getting me into music uh, at the music program at Hale Junior High, because he told me in like five minutes, you should go in and take trumpet and then practice and get good. And then you go on the, 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 senior band and the jazz band then you'll win the music award i'm like okay and i went off to play baseball and then and the next thing i knew i did all that within and i literally i still have that i have it right here actually the you my still first, have it yeah my first award from 1976 the outstanding achievement award from oh my god junior high so uh and mark Schulman, my, my buddy was also in that program and he he was the other winner of that for the orchestra so but uh, yeah, I, I had played the drums as a kid. I got a drum every year for Christmas and, um, I got an actual set when I was nine from Remco. They made this, uh, 
drum set that had real Remo heads. It had a snare drum, had a bass drum, had a plastic uh, pedal, a little cymbal and a little cowbell. And we would all kind of play. But then I got a practice pad and started to take lessons, but I, I wasn't disciplined. I couldn't sit down and work on rudiments. I could play a, a drum beat, but I just didn't have the thing. And so when we were in um, like, maybe I was 10 or 11, our, our neighborhood was gonna start a band and they told my brother, you can play drums. So we had the pad, he started taking drum lessons and then I took up the trumpet and then later guitar. And that's how that all. Uh, you know, the title song to Planets, I found it very cool and trippy. It reminds, I like songs that build. I like, you know, something that I, I feel like I'm on a train. Uh, you know, when first time I heard I Robot by Alan Parsons, their second album, I remember going, this is made for me. Tell me about the title song. The title song Planets is interesting because it started off as an improvisation. Uh, the first time I did it was in Italy at that place that I play every year. And I was rehearsing for the night's concert. So I'm in this room and it's got a lot of ambience. And I wanted to do something with the Ebo because I've been using the Ebo. So I just uh, basically kind of, well, I'll do this, but it'll probably cut off. I just took the my loop pedal and just did this. I went... <laughs> And that got me started. So then I went, okay, well, that's that's a measure. So I'll just build a chord. And I just, you know. Totally cut off. I hate that. I hate that. It always cuts off. Anyway, so then I put the bass thing in. And so it started as an improvisation. And then when I was getting ready to do the, well, they did the show for, for Space Channel and I played that. I said, this will be the theme because it reminded me of kind of weaving through space and they loved it. So I did that. And then when I recorded it, it still wasn't quite, you know, it's, it's different every time because the length is always depending upon, I have two loop pedals. So the initial loop is one measure, but then I go into a second loop when I play the melody with the ebos. And it can be 32 bars, it could be 64, it can be 48, I don't know. I never think about it, I just play it. So uh, it's developed a lot. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel and share our videos. Uh, information on David Becker in the comment section. Information on David Becker in the description. If you want to make a donation to the channel, there's a PayPal link right at the top. You can join our Patreon and get early access to our videos. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book.